You said your dad was a 442 vet, so that means he qualified for the GI Bill. He could have gone to college, but you're saying he did not? Unfortunately, you know, as soon as he came back from Europe uh, and uh, returned to Lanai, uh, his father died unexpectedly. And so um, my father, uh, because he was the youngest in the household and his siblings had all left the island already, uh, stayed on Lanai to take care of his mother. So he was from a generation that uh, was really, had this uh, Japanese value of oyakoko imbued in him. And so I think that, you know, basically he said, it's my responsibility to take care of my mother. Do you think he ever regretted that choice? No, if he did, I never heard him uh, articulate it. But I think that that was probably why he expected my brother and me to go to college. That sense of doing what's right was passed on from father to son. Born and raised on Lanai, Colbert Matsumoto would remember his dad's leadership by example when he took on some of the most powerful people in Hawaii and helped reshape the multi-billion dollar Bishop Estate. Colbert Matsumoto, next on Long Story Short. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox is Hawaii's first weekly television program produced and broadcast in high definition. Aloha mai kako. Colbert Matsumoto went from plantation life on Lanai to become a business and community leader in Honolulu. He's chairman of Island Insurance. Matsumoto's life and career have been driven by a desire to impact lives, a motivation he'd seen his parents put into action as workers on Lanai's pineapple plantation. You know, I, I grew up in a time when uh, I, I would like to call it the golden period of the plantations in Hawaii. Life was really nice uh, growing up on Lanai. Uh, our family, I think, uh, you know, we had a comfortable uh, lifestyle. Uh, we, you know, didn't have a lot of extravagance, but, uh, you know, we had a TV set. You know, we, um, my, I was in the Boy Scouts. Uh, you know, my parents were members of the PTA. You know, we went to, to church on Sundays, you know, and so it was a, a nice uh, uh, place to grow up in. And so, uh, as I look back on it, uh, you know, <clears throat> I realize how uh, almost idyllic it was to grow up in a place like that. But when I was growing up there, uh, I couldn't wait to leave. Because it was too small town, people all knew each other's business, maybe? Yeah, it was confining. Uh, it was, I grew up in a community of 2,500 people. Uh, there were many occasions when, you know, I would get into mischief as a little kid on one side of the town, and by the time I got home, my mom would know all about it, you know, and so, uh, yeah, it was hard to uh, remain anonymous. When you said you couldn't wait to get away, w were there other things besides getting ratted on for mischief? Oh, yeah, no, <clears throat> I think that growing up, uh, we, had a, we had a TV set, um, and I would watch shows about other places, uh, uh, and, I always longed for the opportunity to experience some of the things that I saw in the TV programs because I didn't get away from Lanai very much. Uh, I had never um, had the opportunity to visit the mainland until I went to college. And so uh, I felt somewhat isolated and confined as I grew older and uh, wanted to have the opportunity to experience different things. Um, the main employer on the island at that time was Dole, right? right. And did your parents work for Dole? Yeah, both my parents worked for Dole, as my grandparents also. Uh, pretty much everybody on the island worked for Dole unless you worked for the state or the county uh, or some of the retail establishments in the town. There are drawbacks to a company town, obviously, when you're, you're held in their thrall. They're the, the main gig right. for employment. Well, you know, I think that, uh, yeah, the only jobs that were available were on the plantation, which is why, you know, growing up, we all knew that once we graduated, we were expected to leave the island because there were no opportunities for young people after they graduated from high school on Lanai. Which your parents had that expectation of, right? Oh yeah, the parents, but uh, you know, it was also the economic reality of uh, the island. Were you concerned, what am I gonna do? How am I gonna make it? No, uh, you know, I think my parents always raised me with the expectation that I was uh, supposed to go to college. They, they themselves had not gone to college, so they didn't care which college or what I studied, uh, you know, but they just wanted me to go to college and graduate from college. Did they explicitly give you lessons of life? They did, uh, you know, in different ways. Uh, so, you know, they would uh, basically try to teach me certain values, but then they also, I think, 
taught me a lot just by their uh, example. F your father, for example, what did he teach you? What did you come away with? One of the things that he was heavily involved in was with uh, the ILWU because the union figured very significantly in our community. So my father would share with me some of the stories of uh, the struggles that uh, the union and the employees had to go through in the beginning um, because he was a 442 veteran and so when he came back one of the things that he and you know uh, people of his generation were struggling for were uh, not just economic justice but also social reforms in the community so uh, the union, the ILWU, was very significant in, I think, bringing about some changes, uh, like on the plantation. Because many of them uh, didn't, couldn't, didn't have the opportunity to own their homes. So one of the things that they struggled for was to have the opportunity to buy their own homes, which many of the uh, workers did. Under your dad's tenure? Yeah, during the time that uh, he was involved with the uh, ILWU. What was your mother like? Or what is she like? Because, you know, she's still with us. Right. Uh, my mother was a, uh, a strong woman. You know, she uh, was uh, uh, made sure that my brother and I kept out of trouble, which she didn't always succeed at. Uh, but but she uh, always found out. Yeah, she found out. But uh, uh, she was a stickler for the rules, and uh, you know, she uh, really was uh, had a strong sense of fairness, of right and wrong, and uh, uh, and I think that uh, that. Uh, enabled her to uh, go from being a pineapple picker to uh, one of the first uh, female wahine lunas on the plantation. What so. was that like? How did so? Did she boss men around? Uh, no, she usually uh, headed uh, you know uh, gangs of women uh, who were uh, you know picking pineapple for the plantation. But uh, well, that's wonderful, a wahine luna. Right, but that wasn't until uh, you know the. Uh, late 70s when uh, you know equal rights became more of an issue for women. So it sounds like both of your parents were they challenged challenged for for more fairness for equity. Right. I think that uh, you know that generation uh, they were second generation Japanese Americans uh, that generation really was focused on bringing about uh, you know s social change for the benefit of the community and so uh, both of them made contributions in various ways through the activities that they were involved in and volunteering. And, and there were among many in the community that were also you know, engaged in uh, those kinds of uh, efforts on behalf of the group as opposed to just for their own personal benefit. Colbert Matsumoto was valedictorian of his high school class on Lanai. He went on to college in the Bay Area and graduated from law school at the University of California at Berkeley. He wanted to be a lawyer to have an impact on society. When I went up to college, it was the first time I was up on the mainland, and so it was uh, a total t culture shock for me. I, I had never been on the mainland before. I had never um, seen an urban environment like that. Uh, so it, it was definitely an eye-opening experience. How was your college experience? What did you decide you were going to do with your life, or did you decide then? I had gone to college with the intent of becoming a high school social studies teacher. So that was my uh, objective going in. Uh, but halfway through, uh, I came home <coughs> for a summer and worked at uh, uh, a warehouse on a night shift crew. And there were uh, three other guys that were working on the crew that had already graduated from UH uh, in education. One had a master's degree, the other two had 50-year certificates, and none of them could find jobs at the DOE. That's right, I remember that was the time of a teacher uh, surplus. So I figured I needed to find something else, and that's when I decided, well, I guess I'll try applying to law school, which is what I ended up doing. Any particular reason? Well, I, I, you know, I had never met a lawyer before. Uh, I had never uh, uh, been in a courtroom or knew anything about what the practice of law was at the time. Uh, you know, I just knew that lawyers went to court. The Perry Mason, the Defenders, those were my images of uh, lawyers, and, and I thought, you know, lawyers made a lot of money and didn't have to work hard, uh, <laughs> and so I thought that okay, maybe that would be a good profession to get into. Uh, but I also knew that lawyers uh, had the ability to uh, bring about uh, change, uh, that they had certain knowledge base that allowed for an advocacy of different ideas and uh, 
So I thought that uh, by becoming a lawyer, I would be able to uh, have an impact in terms of society. Because, you know, I grew up in the 60s, so it was a time of a lot of uh, social change, the civil rights movement, the Vietnam War and the anti-war movement. Uh, it was also a time when, you know, the environmental movement first started to uh, get started. And so there was a lot of idealism, I think, with my generation. And so I looked at uh, you know, practicing law as being an opportunity to become a more of a contributor to the kinds of uh, s social changes that were taking place in society. You were used to being um, a, the, a really smart guy in all your classes up till now. And now in law school, every, everyone was probably the smartest in the class they came from right. before. What was that like? It was very intimidating. Like I said, I, I had no clue what uh, being a lawyer was all about. And so uh, I almost flunked my first semester uh, of law school because I, <clears throat> I thought a contract was a the piece of paper that uh, you, know, you, you put an agreement on. I didn't realize that it was a legal concept that had you know, certain uh, components to it. And so the, the concepts associated with law were so foreign to me. So I had a hard time uh, grasping a lot of that uh, when I first went to law school. Do you think it was maybe part of it was because you were used to more of a handshake and your word was good and it was sort of uncomplicated on Lanai? No, I, I, I think I was pretty much just naive and clueless about <laughs> what uh, I had elected to pursue as a, uh, in law. So uh, fortunately I had a professor who was very sympathetic and I had uh, some uh, fellow classmates that were very supportive and encouraging. And so uh, I uh, stuck it out and managed to do okay. Culbert Matsumoto did something quite unusual after he passed the bar exam and was qualified to practice law. He embarked on a six month journey that continues to inform his life. I entered a Zen monastery. So I shaved my head and then uh, went into this Zen monastery and trained. Uh, Where was it? It was in Kalihi Valley. So it was uh, Chozenji. It's uh, uh, Rinzai Zen Temple. Uh, and I had heard about the, the teacher there, uh, Tanoe Tenshin Roshi, who was uh, a Zen, who was an accomplished martial artist, uh, but, but also a Zen uh, teacher. And so uh, I had uh, trained in the martial arts when I was a, uh, a kid growing up. And so, you know, I had an interest in it, <clears throat> but I had also realized that Zen was the philosophical uh, underpinnings of Japanese martial arts, and so I wanted to learn more about that. And so that's why I, you know, asked him if I could, you know, train with him at his temple. And wh what did you learn? You know, I wasn't quite sure what to expect. Um, it was a very uh, rigorous and arduous kind of training that uh, physically, a demanding training that I went through while I was there. Uh, but it was also psychologically very stressful and uh, difficult. When you said arduous, I don't really know what that means in terms of meditation or, or Zen studies. We would get up at like, you know, uh, you know 4.30 in the morning. We would sit in uh, meditation for an hour and a half from 5.30. Uh, and then we would you know, have breakfast and then we would work we would do martial arts training from 8 to 10 in the morning, and then we would have to work out in the gardens or do some construction activity, and then in the afternoon, uh, you know, we would uh, bathe, and then we would go through another uh, period of intense meditation, and then we would do martial arts training from, uh, you know, 7.30 to like 10 o'clock at night, and, uh, you know, it was just physically very demanding, and, I mean, I. I lost a lot of weight while I was going through that, and uh, it was it was very tough uh, in, in both physically and psychologically. And was it meant to reduce you to who you really are, to to take away the external stuff? Right. It, it basically the, the the training had a lot to do with uh, you know uh, freeing you from your dependence on the kinds of things that you grow up with, uh, thinking that these are real things that you can hang on to. Uh, in terms of defining who you are and uh, defining your life and how you lead your life. There are definitely going to be times when you're not going to be able to overcome certain things, you know, but uh, you have to try. So it's more about the, the effort and how it transforms you as a person by taking on that, 
the challenge. That's interesting because as a <clears throat> lawyer, I think you're pretty goal oriented, but you're saying you learned how to accept that the effort is the, you know, is the main point. Right. I think, you know, as, as human beings, uh, you know, we have the capacity to continue to evolve and change and grow, uh, but you have to make the effort at it and you have to be willing to take the risk associated with, uh, you know, experiencing those kinds of changes in your life. Following his Zen training, Colbert Matsumoto went into business as a solo law practitioner. He shared office space with a man who had become governor, Ben Cayetano. Later, he joined the law firm of the late Wallace Fujiyama, one of Hawaii's finest trial lawyers. Yet Matsumoto says his early years in law were hardly a success. The first thing I did was uh, I hung my shingle and tried to practice law on my own for two years, which was a disaster. Why? Uh, because I wasn't prepared. Uh, you know, law school doesn't really prepare you to practice law. To run a business, is that the part of it that got no, you? or is it, it, it was, there was so much more to, uh, you know, being a good lawyer than what you learn in law school. And so I really needed to be mentored uh, and uh, work with some people that were more experienced who could in turn teach me the ropes and help me understand, you know, what you did as a good lawyer. Um, so that's what I, uh, so I ended up giving it up and uh, getting a job with uh, Wally Fujiyama's law firm. He established himself even on a, the national scene as a, a very accomplished trial attorney. Uh, but, you know, Wally, uh, for all his uh, success as a lawyer, uh, never forgot his ties to the community. And uh, I think that uh, for him, uh, that was, you know, an important, uh, he, he saw it as a, res a social responsibility that he bore to not just focus on his own uh, law practice and uh, pursuing uh, you know, opportunities for himself, but also to contribute to the benefit of the community in terms of, you know, uh, uh, the lives of other people. The other thing about him that I thought was uh, really admirable was that he was a risk taker. And so he wasn't hesitant to put himself out front uh, and to become the subject of criticism. Do you remember in that time when you were struggling to run your own place? Do you remember um, feeling embarrassed that another lawyer saw you do something? Oh yeah, no, there were uh, many times when, you know, I realized that, you know, I was, uh, you know, over my head in terms of, uh, you know, the assignment that I had. And it was frustrating. Um, it was frequently humiliating. Did you second guess yourself, saying, I shouldn't have done this? I shouldn't have gotten, this is not my deal? Oh, definitely. Uh, no, I thought to myself that, you know, I mean, th this was uh, um, not the right career path, and uh, which is why I, I abandoned it. But you stayed in law, you didn't abandon law. No, you... no, but quite honestly, I, I hated practicing law. I, th I thought it was a mistake to have become a lawyer because uh, I, I just didn't enjoy it. Uh, it took me over 10 years before, you know, I finally started to feel more comfortable about what I was doing and uh, uh, began to enjoy it. In 1996, Colbert Matsumoto was appointed the court master for Bishop Estate. It was a role that required him to examine the finances and structure of the multi-billion dollar trust for Native Hawaiians. Within a year, the estate came under fire amid allegations of gross mismanagement, and many called for the powerful and highly paid trustees to resign. Matsumoto unexpectedly found himself taking on the trustees in a scathing 120-page report he issued to the court. When the judge appointed me to be the court master, uh, the controversy hadn't interrupted. Uh, I knew that uh, being court master for Bishop State was a, a high-profile uh, engagement, but I had no clue that it was going to be as controversial as it ended up being. Um, so it wasn't until <clears throat> uh, almost a year after I had been appointed that things kind of erupted. The Broken Trust essay was published, the march on Kauai Hau, uh, a Plaza occurred, and uh, by then I started to realize that, uh, you know, this assignment that I had undertaken was going to require that I uh, take on the trustees, uh, and that was kind of an intimidating notion. Uh, to think about at that time, because I had just started my own law firm a couple of years before that. 
And so I, I actually thought to myself, you know, okay, here I'm in this situation where if I do my job right, I'm going to end up getting uh, five of the most powerful people in Hawaii upset at me. So I did think about uh, tendering my resignation to the judge. But as I was kind of weighing that decision, I reflected on, uh, you know, why did I go to law school? Why did I want to become a lawyer? And I thought about the idealism that I had when I was in my 20s and wanting to, you know, make a positive contribution to society. And so I thought to myself that, you know, here I'm in a position where I could make a difference if I did my job right and if I did it in a professional way. And am I going to walk away from it? Uh, and so. When I looked at it in that way, I decided that, no, I should stick this out. And that's what I ended up doing. And what did you find? You saw the raw data, or at least what raw data was presented to you. Well, I, I found, uh, you know, a, a lot of issues with respect to um, accountability and transparency. Um, you know, a lot of investments that they had uh, engaged in um, were not going well. Uh, were not performing um, as they should have. The other thing that they had done was that they had uh, <coughs> divided up areas of responsibility among the five of them uh, so that each of them basically had control over a different aspect of uh, the estate, uh, which I found to be a violation of the trust that had been uh, given to them because Princess Pawahi had basically designated that there were five trustees that were all supposed to act in concert rather than, you know, five individual trustees five that CEOs. had their own kulianas and could make decisions that would be unchallenged within their kulianas. And so, you know, so th uh, that was c part of the, uh, the governance of Kamehameha schools that I felt that uh, were not in conformity with what the, the princess's original wishes were and certainly not in conformity with a trust law. What was the turning point, do you think, in the, in the legal case that really turn, turned the trust upside down re and resulted in the removal of a, of a trustee? Things started to deteriorate over the three years that uh, you know, this was going on for the trustees. And uh, I think that uh, uh, they, uh, as I said, hunkered down. They were very resistant to making a number of the changes that the court expected of them. And then uh, the real, uh, you know, uh, blow that I think uh, did them in was when IRS came in and uh, raised a number of concerns about the their behavior and their management of the estate. But that was a lot of that was based on what you had put out, right? Uh, yes and no. Uh, you know, the IRS had done a lot of their own homework, uh, and they had other issues that they uh, wanted to raise with the trustees. And so, uh, but you know, IRS has a very heavy hand, and when they enter the picture, you know, it's pretty pretty tough <laughs> to fight them. Colbert Matsumoto ended his 20-year legal career in 1999 and became chairman of Island Insurance. Matsumoto is known as a strategic problem solver. He used his skills and his influence to help save the Japanese Cultural Center of Hawaii from foreclosure in 2002. Matsumoto led a team that successfully raised $9 million in just a few months. How did you actually get the money? Well, you know, it it took a lot of uh, hard work and effort. And so, you know, our, our group, uh, and we called it the Committee to Save the Center. We knew that, uh, you know, this was a desperate cause and that nobody likes to contribute money to what they think is going to be ultimately a failed effort because, uh, you know, you've heard the, uh, the term you know, throwing good money after bad. And so nobody wanted to throw good money after bad. So what we pledged to uh, our, the audience uh, was that, we would only cash their checks if we had raised enough money to, you know, save the center. But until then, all we were going to do was collect checks. And so that's what we did. And I think that that gave people the confidence to contribute to us. Whenever we would receive a donation, I would write a, uh, you know, I would, we would do a personalized letter to that person, thanking them for their contribution. And I would sign every letter. And so my wife would, stay up with me at night to help me stuff envelopes and get the letters ready to be mailed uh, out to the people that donated. And so um, 
Yeah, it it was uh, uh, it was a it was it took a lot of work, but it was very satisfying. When you look back at that, I mean, did you learn new things about yourself? Not so much about myself as much as uh, my confidence in my community was not misplaced. It reaffirmed my sense that you know uh, we are a special place, we are a special community, uh, that uh, you know Hawaii is a place that uh, you know. Uh, retains a lot of the qualities that uh, <clears throat> growing up on Lanai, I think uh, I, I felt were unique once I was able to contrast it to my experiences on the mainland. And so it reaffirmed my uh, desire to try to maintain those qualities about our community. Colbert Matsumoto chose the business boardroom instead of following his parents into a labor union. However, his strong sense of community goes back to his parents' values and the sense of extended family in his upbringing on rural Lanai. To that, he added higher education and Zen training. Thank you, Colbert Matsumoto, for sharing your story with us. And thank you for joining us. For PBS Hawaii and Long Story Short, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Aloha, hui ho. For audio and written transcripts of all episodes of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, visit pbshawaii.org. To download free podcasts of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, go to the Apple iTunes Store or visit pbshawaii.org. My own daughters, my two daughters, when they were in elementary school, we went to Lanai for a visit then. Uh, I remember giving them you know, like ten dollars and telling them that you know why don't you go buy some ice cream you know from the, the ice cream store and so uh, they looked at me like you know well aren't you going to take us you know and I said no you know you know where it is so why don't you walk from grandma's house to you know the ice cream store and so so they did and uh, it was the first time they had ever done that and you before. felt okay on because it was a little oh yeah no I felt uh, perfectly fine about it and uh, it was definitely a new experience for them.